Uh, we're fortunate tonight and privileged to welcome Keith McHenry, who is one of the co-founders of Food Not Bombs. And Keith is coming to us live from Food Not Bombs Central out in the wide open hills of uh, New Mexico. So we get to see everything happening on the scene and the real deal. So welcome, Keith. Thank you for joining us tonight. Great. Thanks for having me. That's really fun. <laughs> I've never really done a too many interviews out in uh, the free school out inside, so it's really fun. Yeah, and I just wanted to let everybody know that just before we connected, Keith um, was finishing up part of the day's projects, which was building a fire pit out here. And the site that he's on is actually the Food Not Bombs free school, which we're going to talk about more later. So um, why don't you give us a brief introduc introduction to yourself? and just describe the area you're in geographically a little bit, and then we'll launch into some of the questions. Cool. Well, I'm in uh, Taos, New Mexico, which is northern New Mexico, at about 7,000 feet. And then we have the mountains above us, so we're in the San Luis Valley. And um, this is a very poor area of the country. Um, New Mexico is the hungriest state in the U.S. often, or sometimes uh, Mississippi beats us. And we're in a, at the Food Not Bombs Free School, which is where we're uh, trying to set up a program to teach people organic gardening and stuff like that. So um, those are some of the things that we're working on right now. And today we were making a fire pit and uh, making plans for Los Alamos Nuclear uh, Labs. We're going to provide food at a protest up there um, pretty soon. Uh, on August 5th and 6th, usually, uh, anniversary of Hiroshima Day. And um, so that's the kind of stuff we're doing here. And uh, the volunteers that are um, at the uh, free school are mostly Food Not Bombs activists from places like um, uh, S South Florida. We had one from uh, Israel recently visiting here. And then, of course, local people that have uh, been helping us out. Oh, great. And it's wonderful to have you live and on the site. So so hopefully we can do just a little bit of a show and tell on the site here in a minute. So um, let's get into a little bit of Food Not Bombs history so we can place everything in context. And uh, why don't you tell us uh, exactly what is Food Not Bombs for those of us that don't know and how and when did it start? Well, uh, Food Not Bombs is an all-volunteer movement, and we're active in a thousand cities of the world. And basically what we do is we collect food that can't be sold, and we make it into uh, vegan and vegetarian meals that we share on the streets. And uh, along with our meals, we have literature and banners and, and try, uh, off, sometimes even puppet shows and uh, music, things like that, so that we can uh, do outreach to the public. And part of our idea is with uh, billions of dollars going to the military, there's really no reason anybody should go hungry. And it's not like you even have to eliminate the military altogether. If you just diverted some of the funding, uh, roughly 50 cents of every tax dollar goes to the military in the United States. If some of that money was diverted to education, health care, other things like that, there wouldn't be a need for people to eat at soup kitchens or to stand in line to eat at Food Not Bombs other than just to have fun and visit with their friends. So um, we've been doing it 32 years. We started in uh, Boston in 1980. I was a produce worker, and um, I was throwing away all this produce, and we realized that was kind of crazy, and I started taking it to these housing projects about uh, uh, three, four blocks away on Portland Street in Cambridge. And um, across the street from the housing projects where we were delivering the food was a weapons lab that was um, where they were designing the guidance system for the MX uh, missile and uh, Minuteman and other intercontinental uh, nuclear missiles. And so we um, thought, well, wow, that's really crazy. And uh, that kind of influenced our name to be Food Not Bombs because you had hungry people on one side of the street and people making lots of money designing nuclear weapons on the other side of the street. And another thing that started that we did was a friend of ours was arrested in um, Seabrook Nuclear Power Station at a protest. <clears throat> and um, we were trying to raise money for his legal defense, so we started these bake sales. And at one point, uh, um, we were really making no money, but we 
Uh, also, I had another way of uh, Smooth Move, which is a little moving company. And we moved this family, and they were um, um, throwing away a poster that said, wouldn't it be a beautiful day if uh, schools had all the money they needed and the Air Force had all the bake sale to buy a bomber? And we thought, wow, that's a really cool idea. So we bought some military uniforms, dressed up like uh, generals, went out with our baked goods and the sign that the, uh, that the clients gave us. And then we started telling people that we're generals trying to buy a bomber and that got people to stop and talk to us. And then we would admit really what it was we were doing. And that gave us the connection between street theater and feeding the hungry. And so that, that uh, evolved until on March 26, uh, 1981, we decided to do a soup kitchen outside the stockholders meeting of the Bank of Boston at South Station. And uh, while we we're making the food, we realized that maybe there wouldn't be enough people to really look like a soup kitchen. So we went to the Pine Street Inn, gave a little talk about what we were going to do the next day. The reason we were protesting the bank at the stockholders meeting was that the board of directors that were meeting that day were also on the board of all these weapons uh, companies. They were building a nuclear power station. They were buying the station. It was all these same kind of economic uh, policies that led to the Great Depression. So we thought we'd dress up as hobos, take the food that was being thrown away, that we were recovering, make it into uh, big pots of soup, go out on the streets and, and hand it out. It was so amazing that we decided to quit our jobs and do nothing but this. So that was, again, um, uh, March 26, 1981. And uh, what was remarkable is that uh, Occupy Boston was at the exact same location 32 years later, or uh, 30 years later, almost exactly to the day. That was pretty crazy. Well, it's, it's almost like the more things change, the more they remain the same. And, you know, all these these centers of protest rising up are pretty consistent um, and it's been an interesting evolution to watch that what would you say the original goal of food not bombs was well our, in those days Ronald Reagan had just been elected so we were somewhat interested in trying to get the public uh, in the Boston area in particular but also in the in New England because we would share food uh, at Bread and Puppet, actually, and uh, which you had mentioned before up in Vermont, and we took food down to New York City, Washington, D.C. And our idea was to talk to people and say, look, it, um, it's po the issue of hunger and poverty is, a, a, is an issue that there are solutions for, but that if uh, Ronald Reagan has his way, he's going to start diverting funding from things that people need towards the military, and there's going to end up being all these homeless people increase in poverty, cuts in education, health care, and so on. And we also uh, wanted to make the point that if, if you had a plant-based diet, uh, eating uh, vegan and vegetarian meals, that it would be lower impact on the environment and that more people could be fed and people would be healthier. And we, so we're trying to introduce people to uh, what we were calling vegetarian, which was essentially vegan, really, um, food by just making really fantastic meals that we would um, take out on the streets. And we would do street theater about all kinds of different issues, you know, like uh, um, the, there was a war in El Salvador, the Soviet invasion of Poland, and so on. Mm -hmm. And we would try to get people to see the links between uh, racism, sexism, homophobia, so other exploitations, how they were used to further uh, large corporate uh, interests, and how war was uh, a whole part of this and that none of this was really necessary if we started making a, a egalitarian um, uh, way of, of interacting and, and working together and to, to try to keep from having a militaristic sort of situation. So that's what we're trying to do. Excellent. Well, that was, that was a good summary. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about how Food Not Bombs has evolved over the years. I know it, it started in, in Cambridge slash Boston. Uh, there was a migration out to the Bay Area, and now you said you're in a thousand cities worldwide. So that's a that's a pretty big evolution over 30 years. So won't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, what ended up happening was uh, I moved to San Francisco in uh, um, with my wife Andrea in 1986. 
uh, December of 86 is when we left. In 87, we uh, settled in in San Francisco. And uh, th- and we decided to start a new Food Not Bombs chapter there after Brian Wilson, uh, who was a vet- Vietnam vet who was working protesting the war in El Salvador, had been hit by a train at Concord Naval Weapons Station in, in uh, Concord, uh, California. And so we thought, innocently, we would just start to do this food in, um, uh, you know, at Golden Gate Park. And uh, we ended up getting a grant from American Peace Test, which uh, in, in Boston, to provide food at the Nevada test site in, uh, in, uh, during these uh, protests against nuclear testing that were happening. So our initial equipment for San Francisco came through that grant. And we did the action for 10 days. And then we came back to San Francisco, started the Monday meal at Golden Gate Park. And um, at one point, it was suggested we asked for a permit. So we wrote a letter for a permit. And to our surprise, uh, uh, they did not respond, the Recreation and Parks Department, until August 15, 1988, when 45 riot police emerged from Golden Gate Park and arrested uh, uh, nine of us for serving food without a permit. And we also did not know that the media would appear. So the San Francisco Chronicle had been tuned into this. Uh, the police had told them. A huge photo ended up in the paper. And as a result, uh, people contacted us wanting to get arrested with us the next Monday. So we organized a meeting. Had a Mark, uh, um, uh, 29 arrests. And this time, it made the New York Times, the uh, uh, London Times, the Times of India. It was on CNN, which was a brand new TV company at the time. And then people started riding us and calling us like crazy to, uh, to see how they could start groups in their community. Mm-hmm. So we made a fly. I happened to be taking notes on how we started San Francisco Food Not Bombs in case anyone wanted to reproduce it. So we made a flyer, Seven Steps to Starting the Food Not Bombs. And there was this series of arrests that inspired the creation of first chapters, mostly in the U.S., uh, and then a couple in Canada. Then there was another wave of arrests uh, at the first occupation that we helped organize in 1989, where uh, at the end of it, we were, uh, and we were inspired by Tenement Square, which was happening at the same time, mm-hmm. and this was for the civil rights of homeless people. And uh, it was those arrests at the end of that tent city protest after that occupation that inspired the uh, Melbourne, Australia group, the Brixton, England group, the group in uh, Prague, uh, Czechoslovakia. And it was just like this, where there'd be these series of arrests. Ultimately, in San Francisco, there was 1,000 arrests um, for sharing free food. The last 700 were uh, were basically uh, felony conspiracy to serve food in violation of a court order. And so uh, we would end up having to spend the night in jail, things like that. So that, that was really, really heavy-duty stuff that was going on. And uh, we were beaten uh, often. There's a video that we have online called Food Not Bombs Greatest Hits. And you can get the full version of it by uh, you know, online. We have a, a DVD. And uh, I, myself, was beaten uh, 13 times. Uh, I, my sinuses were broken by uh, police hitting me with a nightstick between the eyes. And uh, I was put in a stress position box three times uh, after having my ligaments and t- tendons ripped and, uh, and uh, put in a stress position box in San Francisco for three days each time. And so there was this whole campaign to try to stop us. And it was that camp, those uh, 10 years of arrests and beatings. And uh, I faced 25 to life in prison at one point. All of that ended up doing nothing but backfiring. Oh, here's my uh, friend David leaving. Take care, you guys. I'll see you in a bit. So, um, so we were um, getting, you know, our, those arrests inspired others to start other chapters, and then other people would get arrested in other cities, and then there'd be another wave of food not bombs, and eventually it was just becoming ubiquitous, where, where people were just starting it without even needing to be know of an arrest. So I have to say, each wave of arrest seemed to uh, encourage more interest. Um, last year we were arrested in Orlando. Um, and I did 19 days in jail for feeding people in violation of a large group feeding law they made. And now we're getting some attention because of uh, uh, cities, but roughly 30 cities in the U.S. now are making laws banning the distribution of food outside to the public. And, of course, that 
would horribly interfere with our ability to uh, do outreach to organize to change society. And uh, also, a lot of people don't want to eat inside, and it would increase our expenses. Part of the beauty of doing this is that anybody can do it, and we could do it outside where it's neutral ground for everybody, and you're not paying money for rent and stuff like that. So um, this seems to be a concerted effort that started particularly right after the occupations to drive us out of sight. Um, yeah, and I want to come back and visit that topic, but we're having – a lot of Skype network problems on this end. I don't know if you see that that I'm freezing or not. But what I want to do Everyone is is, is break the connection and call you right back, okay? And we'll see if we can get a better video okay. feed. Okay, so I'll call you right back. And if the chatters okay, will okay, just hang, hang on just for a second, we'll see if we can't get a little bit better for us. Um, sorry, sorry about that. And we're going to pick up the conversation on that particular question there, Crusader. So just give us another moment. Okay. Yep. Yeah, we'll see if this is any any better. It's you know, this is the problems with Skype, but we'll 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 muddle through it as best we can. So right. um you kinda gave us that rundown um, and the evolution about that. And one of the questions that I had um, that I was going to bring up later on was what is the root source of the resistance of, of the authorities and law enforcement against feeding people? What, what, is, what is the deal with that? Why is there so much animosity and so much controversy around what seems like such a basic human need that is being fulfilled by an all-volunteer organization, I want to point out and make that clear, that Food Not Bombs is all-volunteer, top to bottom, correct? Yeah, yeah, we have no paid staff, including myself. I live in a school bus, and and uh, I try not to have any expenses, uh, you know, just so that no one has to get paid. So I do random weird jobs to make a living, and that's basically what anybody that does Food Not Bombs does. Pretty, or they got a job and they just do food bombs part time. So the the issue, the concern about uh, for the authorities um, is we learned over time what the concern was. Um, but initially, the basic idea that we found was that the uh, Bechtel Corporation, Chevron, Raytheon Missile Systems, some of these military contractors were concerned that if we were sharing free food outside with a banner that said food not bombs, that the public would um, start to think that money should be diverted from military spending towards human needs. And we didn't have much trouble, really, with the authorities, in t like in Boston ever, really, um, until San Francisco. And it turned out that's because World Bank America World Headquarters was there. All these military contractors were either there or in Silicon Valley, and they were very, very concerned that this could take off. Now, we think that there's probably more to it than just that, that somehow, um, you know, there was research done that, uh, you know, said that this was true. And we, after the first arrest, we uh, discovered that our my home phone was wiretapped on, uh, uh, on a memo dated the September 27th, 1988, where they say, I'm going to take over an army base with 3,000 people uh, in San Francisco, and it was going to be more people than I had the year before, and all this stuff. You can see online, uh, uh, foodnotbombs.net uh, slash spy.html. And uh, the thing is that on, on that uh, memo, they also said that we were in alliance with these other peace groups and stuff like that. And the reality is, we were just going to take food to a protest against the war in El Salvador. We had very little to do, or I had nothing to do with organizing the protest. I didn't even really know exactly the details. All I knew was I was invited, you know, our chapter was invited to bring food to a protest uh, outside the Presidio base, uh, military base, on uh, October 15, 1988. So then after that, it turned out uh, that Thanksgiving, we have a Food Not Bombs button, which I'm sort of wearing here, and um, and we, people wore these bu buttons there and uh, went home for Thanksgiving. And then National Guards people would stop people at the airports and go, oh, we studied this group in uh, domestic terrorism school. 
this Thanksgiving weekend, and it's America's most hardcore terrorist group. And so well, that seemed pretty funny. Uh, we didn't really know what the issue was with that. But we kept ha getting arrests. We were, had smear campaigns in, in the media, uh, all kinds of problems. And then in April of 2009, on, I happened to tune into the C-SPAN uh, one, one night after I spoke at uh, Princeton University. And there was a lecture by two, uh, two State Department officials from the Fletcher School of Diplomacy that explained that the pro they, it was about um, comparing the people that share the free vegan meals in the park and Al-Qaeda, which is more dangerous. And they said that in the end, in, su in summary, that the people sharing the free vegan meals are much more dangerous than Al-Qaeda because um, the American public might think that money should be diverted from military spending towards education and health care, and therefore there wouldn't be enough to fight the enemies like Al-Qaeda, even though Al-Qaeda, they said, was dwindling. They said that the vegan group uh, had served for 30 years and would probably thir share and, get, and still be active 30 years into the future, but Al-Qaeda was like only 20 years and probably would disappear um, you know, very shortly that they're already down to 126 people or something. It was this crazy thing. So first I'm in disbelief, but two nights later I happened to accidentally watch the same show and I was like, whoa, man, that's really incredible. So essentially somebody in the, in the government, in the U.S. government, has come up with this theory that what we're doing is effective and that what we're trying to achieve could actually happen if we kept doing what we're doing, and they don't want that to happen. And so, therefore, um, they consider that an act of terrorism. And I've, I've been taken off of airplanes uh, uh, and questioned by, uh, you know, customs and border, and, I've been, uh, all, you know, all kinds of crazy things have happened. And it, is it, there's also, I've got reams and reams of memos showing that the, you know, that at, not only were they wiretapping us in 88, but they were still doing that to this day. So, um, you know, we've had, you know, I was framed on the three strikes case. There was just a young man that started an 11 months uh, jail sentence up in Toronto for protesting at the uh, G20. We've got Eric McDavid doing 20 years in prison in California. Um, he helped me organize a, with a uh, the uh, informant, Anna, and uh, his two best friends, Zachary and, and Ren, um, uh, Funa Bombs Gathering up, uh, in the days before a protest against genetically modified foods in Philadelphia. He had done nothing, and they uh, were able to pit the defendants against one another and convict them. So we've been under this kind of scrutiny. Now, fortunately, you know, there are, like I say, maybe about 20, 30 Funa Bombs kids in prison right now. And some doing, you know, will probably do life in prison. Um, but the reality is that, uh, you know, there's about 10,000 food not bombs people, almost out of the 10, 15,000 kids that do food not bombs. It's a very small percentage that have gotten in trouble. And the worst trouble that most people usually get in is uh, being arrested for feeding people in violations of some new city law that has been created, like a uh, you know, sharing food to more than 24 people more than twice a year or sharing food uh, in public parks or, or whatever the laws are that are now cropping up all over the U.S. So. Um, I think you're going to make my head explode because, I, you know, I've read all this stuff and I, I know that it's well documented, but to hear it from somebody who has lived through it is just astonishing and it just highlights the, the, the evil of it. it just is nonsensical and it's just totally disturbing. Um, so thank you for your your continued vigilance and stamina and all those other people. It's ridiculous that we live in a culture that penalizes us for wanting to help people eat. Um, so I, I will not get on my soapbox because then I'll take up all the time. <laughs> Um, this is probably, uh, can you give us some examples of some recent Food Not Bombs participation in protests and actions in the U.S.? And maybe just a little bit of insight about how those are typically organized, because Food Not Bombs is, is you know, an example of a decentralized um, autonomous movement for the most part. So a few examples of, you know, I guess it's easy to speak towards you supported some Occupy encampments and stuff like that, but just how that kind of transpires. Okay, yeah, so we'd, um, you know, 
course, when the U.S. was talking, when uh, George Bush was talking about invading Afghanistan and Iraq, we started helping organize in coalition with other organizations protests against those wars. And particularly if you remember the giant protests uh, right before the Iraq war, we had food not bombs activists providing meals to those protests in hundreds of cities. I, I, I happened to visit Zagreb, Croatia at one point, and they told us that they had shared a thousand meals outside the U.S. embassy. So that was one that's been one pattern. Then there has been um, like uh, us taking food to protest uh uh, like clear cutting of the redwoods in California, we were involved in like uh, Redwood Summer and and all, uh, all these other actions like that. So uh, you know, so we ha- we have a history of helping set up base camps and providing food for that. We were also um, we started researching NAFTA uh, early on, North American Free Trade Agreement, and uh, the World Trade Organization and the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. And so we started promoting actions against that. Uh, saying that this kind of economic policy could lead to uh, uh, more poverty, more hunger, more devastation of the environment, and uh, more assaults on our civil liberties. So we um, helped uh, initiate um, a protest in, in Seattle in 1999, November of 99. We started uh, three years before with a tour called the Unfree Trade Tour, where uh, myself and another Food Not Bombs activist from San Bernardino, California, and three activists from the anti-globalization movement in Europe traveled around the U.S. on this tour, on free trade tour, advocating that if the WTO, World Trade Organization, ever had a summit, uh, as they had had in Europe and other places, in North America, we should try to shut it down. And 12 months after our tour, it was announced that there would be um, uh, a summit in, in Seattle. And we talked to Seattle Food Not Bombs. We called our friends at Seeds of Peace, uh, you know, other types of uh, kitchens in the community, mobile kitchens like Rainbow Kitchens and stuff. And we like talked to uh, as many contacts as we could to encourage everyone to go to Seattle um, a group of friends started this uh, organization called the Direct Action Network. We had trainings on nonviolent uh, resistance. Um, we or- we spent lots and lots of time uh, uh, doing scenarios about how we could blockade the World Trade Organization Summit and so on. We broke up into small affinity groups so that you would have your friends and you'd be used to the, how everybody worked and you would have people that were legal support and so on. And then we... we uh, uh, there was a touching story I just recently uh, was reminded of where while people were linking arms in front of the convention center in Seattle, um, Food Not Bombs activists were were uh, spooning food into all the protesters' mouths so they didn't have to unlock their arms. And we also, have, uh, uh, you know, we the protest in 89 was uh, homeless people were uh, being told they were not allowed to live in, outside in San Francisco. They actually approached us and asked for support, and we set up a 24-hour day uh, vegan kitchen in solidarity with the people there, and started sharing food. And we stayed there for 27 days, 24 hours a day. But then we've had other things. There have been like other anti-homeless laws all across the U.S. And so, food not bombs activists. These are receipts. We'll do. Oh, cool. Use. Thank. We'll do other things like that to uh, try to uh, change things. So we've had some pretty interesting stuff happen. Um, in that regard, and then we have provided meals for like blockades of the nuclear weapons site, test site, and uh, you know Nevada. We have um, done a lot. We were involved in the, in uh, some food not bombs activists were actually at the original General Assemblies in New York City, and helping organize the occupation there based on past experience that some of those food not bombs activists had. And then we ended up providing meals uh, and funneling food in to do uh, occupations in hundreds and hundreds of cities around the, the United States. And I was like really moved. I was getting calls from, there were a live stream of Zuccotti Park the first day. And I had people from all over the world calling me about how to help out with food. It was beyond uh, belief and some people even in tears so moved that this was happening and so you know we uh, I personally like donated a huge amount of kitchen equipment and helped set up uh, kitchens in, in uh, first in uh, Chicago then I was in New York then I was at uh, uh, 
I did the McPherson Square in uh, Washington, D.C. Then I did Freedom Plaza, which was something I'd actually been, and Funa Bonza have been working on since probably uh, January, year before. That was the original so-called occupation that was going to happen. But then Adbusters uh, advertised theirs, uh, called for a Wall Street one which on September 17th. And we've actually been working with Adbusters for years. Uh, they announced this thing called Buy Nothing Day years ago mm-hmm. in uh, the ni- 90s. And so we share free vegan meals outside of McDonald's on Buy Nothing Day and do a really, really free markets. And that's something Food Not Bombs kids do all over the world. And uh, we also, on uh, the 16th of October, we do um, Anti-McDonald's Day, and we share vegan burgers in front of McDonald's in hundreds of cities around the world that, on that day. Um, we've, uh, we also do a thing called Food Not Lawns, which is part of what's happening here at the uh, uh at the uh, Food Not Bombs Free School is teaching organic gardening and setting up little gardens uh, with the local community in cities all over the world. Bikes Not Bombs, where we have bike parks, fix up bikes and give them away to people that need bicycles. Food, uh, Homes Not Jails, which is something that I helped start with some friends in the 90s in San Francisco, taking over abandoned buildings. That was during the savings and loan crisis. And then we would fix them up and tell, invite homeless people living on the streets to, uh, to adopt one of the empty buildings, make it their own, and then they would just live in the buildings. According to the book No Trespassing, we had keys to 400 buildings uh, in the 90s in San Francisco and people living in about 200 of those uh, buildings. And then that movement just started up and we started going all over, the going viral. So, um, you know, we try to do these non-hierarchical, decentralized actions all over the world that are also based on meeting people's basic human needs. Yep. And I want to you know, make the point in case it, it was lost in that that you know, kind of chronology there, that these are not new actions and new events. You guys have been doing this for 20, 30 years all over these kinds, these kinds of actions, these kinds of supports. Um, is it generally the model that the food not bombs groups or um, support affinity groups supporting um, the food element of actions or do you guys actually organize larger events yourselves sometimes yeah we we do both things sometimes uh, we just take food to an event that uh, other people have organized sometimes uh, we will be involved in a coalition of other groups helping organize actions and then sometimes we will initiate actions ourselves and invite other people to join in a, in a coalition. So we do all of those things at, uh, at the same time. And then we try to also interject uh, other elements to these protests to make them more interesting. Uh, we've been really big proponents of uh, puppet shows, of giant puppets, of, um, of street theater, that kind of thing, to make the, the actions more of a cultural event as well as a protest, and also we're seriously dedicated to nonviolent direct action. So we uh, have done a lot of that. Um, uh, one of the actions that has been that we initiated, uh, that's been an ongoing project. It's not, you know, really overtly connected to Funa Bombs anymore, but it was initiated by the Funa Bombs kids in Tel Aviv. Was anarchist against the wall, and um, we uh, the the people in Funa Bombs have been invited to provide. I had me- meals at a peace camp on the West Bank, and so we did that. And during the two months of those uh, me- peace camp meals, uh, the people in Funa Bombs came up with this idea of working in solidarity with the uh, farmers on the West Bank to uh, to uh, dismantle the wall between Israel. Uh, they have like a slogan: uh, "No state solution" is their basic slogan. And so they uh, work in in harmony with local Palestinian community to uh to remove the the wall whenever possible mm-hmm. and uh i had the good fortune to arrive like, like uh, the day that that was happening on the first uh, anarchist against the wall action so it's just really uh, amazing so you know you can be that way where the where it's really a, a food not bombs uh in thinking of the concept um in solidarity with other people but it could also be other um situations you know where we've just been invited to um, bring food, you know, uh, right. uh, we worked against GMOs and all kinds of things like that. Um, 
So now would be a good time, I think, just to continue along this line of thinking. Why don't you go ahead and tell us about a few of the current projects that I stumbled across, the free school, of course, being one of them, the World Gathering, and the Elect in Hunger and Poverty Tours. Yeah, so, okay, that's cool. So, yeah, so, the, the you know, every, we tr organize these World Gatherings periodically. The first one was in... Uh, 1992 in San Francisco, and it had 70 people, and it was only a world gathering in that some people from Canada showed up. <laughs> and uh, um, but then uh, who were doing it in Vancouver, uh, BC, um, and then we had another one in '95 where about 600 people uh, actually went through the convergence space that we organized, and we it went on for 10 days. And we often do them in conjunction with something else. So like in that, the first one was in conjunction with the 500th anniversary anniversary of Columbus discovering the new world and San Francisco was the official city to celebrate that so we did those in in concert and uh, the one in 95 was with the 50th anniversary of the founding of the UN and a dedication of a monument in San Francisco to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at a time where we were being arrested every day near where the mon monument was to be erected at UN Plaza but this time uh, we are doing it in, be, in advance of the Republican National uh, Convention in, uh, in Tampa, Florida. And this grew out of a series of meetings that happened uh, when Orlando Food Not Bombs looked like they was going to uh, be facing arrest. And so uh, when that was happening, um, we had a, a gathering in, in Orlando. Food Not Bombs activists from around Florida came. And we decided then to organize the uh, um, a world gathering in Tampa in in the uh, week before the convention, and then we'd feed the protesters coming to the convention. And uh, we have done that at other national conventions. We have served food and fed protesters at the national political conventions, both Democrat and Republican, for you know probably over 20 years, maybe 25 years. And then um, the free school was actually born in the, out of that same period of time. Um, the, there was a group of food not bombs activists from South Florida who were involved in helping, uh, they were doing this amazing actions in Fort Lauderdale and getting a lot of grief by the local authorities for it. And in fact, their house was raided. Um, they had some success, really good success in that they stopped the shipment of primates through the, uh, Fort Lauderdale airport to, uh, labs to be tested on. And so through, uh, and, uh, and they're like, uh, and they're amazing. The, the South Florida movement of Funa Bombs is incredible. They so much remind me of the first uh, Funa Bombs chapter, where they like, they're just like, you know, full out doing Funa Bombs and uh, doing puppet shows, all these things like that. It just was really incredible. So um, th from that, we decided to just organize this free school. So this is really like the us setting it up, trying to figure out really how to do it. So we had a blank slate, which is the uh, acre of farmland that I have in Taos, New Mexico. And we're trying to figure out, uh, you know, like how, how, you know, it's been quite an effort. It was just a piece of land, no well, no water, no anything. So we're like starting from scratch trying to get everything together. And so right now we're hauling water. It took us uh, January is when we had hired a guy to uh, and so now we're trying to get a pump and get up the water the well the plants we're talking about designs for a, a greenhouse uh, the uh, you know workshops on all kinds of things we actually had some pretty interesting stuff happen with uh, um, with Ramel from uh, Haifa Food Not Bombs who came here and and discuss co-counseling and all these amazing things that he's been working on with his chapter and with the people he works with in Israel. So there's a, you know, that's the, our, you know, really to uh, seriously to have like an organized structure of, of workshops and classes. It's going to take until really next summer to get that organized. But this is the, you know, the foundational uh, group of people that are organizing to do that. And the classes themselves are taught by both the students 
and uh, and the, the students are also the teachers, and the teachers are the students. And so, you know, it's free. There's no tuition or anything like that. Although it does, it's going to take us some fundraising to get it off the ground, um, because you know, wells three thousand five hundred dollars, the pumps another, you know, five hundred, stuff like that. You know, we got uh, ten to fifteen people sometimes living here, so you know, we're try- we do do fundraisers and stuff like that. Um, well, that brings up a, a good point because um, that's an ambitious project, the free school. And the other things you do, you know, like it or not, we live in a, in a cash economy. So how are these sorts of projects funded? Is it donations, fundraisers, and how successful are you on outreach and funding to help these projects along? Well, it is very nip and tuck. So the, a lot of the initial funding for the free school and a lot of the project, another aspect of what happens at the free school is that we are sort of the global coordinating office. So even though we're decentralized, non-hierarchical movement, we answer the food toll-free number. We direct people to other Food Not Bombs chapters. We help them start, you know, start chapters. We provide them with information about that. So one of the ways we've been raising money has been uh, doing tours, and I've been doing a lot of speaking tours at colleges since 1995, actually, maybe even 94. And we try to get honorariums from, uh, like, Amnesty International and these clubs, Oxfam and stuff, will bring me in. They'll request funding from the student activity uh, fees to uh to have me speak and i usually start speaking in september and i tour the eastern half of the united states in september october november into december then uh sometimes i'm invited to speak in africa or asia or someplace and i try to get uh people with some money to buy the plane ticket and stuff and go do that and then come back and then i do uh um uh, more more speaking engagements on the western half of the united states the fall the spring semester and uh we have on foodnotbombs.net information on how to to book one of these presentations and if you are not a student uh you can still like uh well a lot of times what will happen is i'll speak uh, on a college campus on monday tuesday wednesday thursday and friday nights maybe only thursday nights and then i'll speak at a bookstore in the local town on the friday or saturday night and then i'll move on to another area on sunday and start it again and i do that like uh every year and the honorariums range from uh sometimes like 150 dollars i try not to do that but sometimes it's the case and the largest we've ever had was uh oberlin uh once uh, donated uh, $3,000, and we were able to take that uh, donation, and that year was pretty successful, and we bought a van for the kids in in uh, Nigeria, and we helped set up 12 Food Not Bombs chapters in Nigeria with the funding from those honorariums. So that's the main thing. But people can go to uh, foodnotbombs.net and donate. There's a Dollar for Peace campaign. Uh, you can actually donate more than a dollar, but, uh, you know, definitely even a dollar, as the website says, if a million people did that, it would Imagine how much funding there would be. We have like an advisory committee, and uh, and uh, all, you can see the whole budget on uh, on the website. Um, you can see the bylaws for the free school and how that's set up. We're trying to get nonprofit tax exempt status for the school itself. Although Food Not Bonds, it's as a entity is a is a you know is a, a non official association of uh, people that just work cooperatively together making decisions by consensus in each of the independent cities. So we don't have any, you know, we really keep our resources low. So you can see how inexpensive, relatively speaking, it is to do what we're doing. And that's largely because we have, uh, we try not to have too many expenses. You know, I live in a, a school bus called Katrina, the second bus to show up in New Orleans after the hurricane. And, um, you know, I've been, I've been living in that now for years. And it's just parked on this land. And, uh, um, and you know, we just, uh, you know, swim in the Rio Grande River or other ways of getting baths. We eat the Food Not Bombs food. You know, we try not to spend 
money except for on stuff that really uh, makes sense. So we might try bulk rice and beans. We might buy cooking equipment. Um, you know, right now, as I'm saying, we're trying to finish the paying for the well and the pump, and, and that will be a huge asset to the free school. And we're buying materials for the, uh, you know, this group that's buying stuff for the, uh, to make sure that everybody's fed at the Republican National Convention and so on. So those are some of the things that are happening. Um, that That's good. Actually, you know, we spoke off off the air that I had um, done an internship with Bread and Puppet, and they operate much the same way, you know, low overhead, you know, doing bulk, and any, any of the income that's generated from anything goes back into to the show, so I'm familiar with that. And it's actually, um, people who haven't lived that way, it's it may be a little bit difficult to understand, but actually it, it can work pretty well. I mean, um, it's not easy, but it is very yeah. effective. And what you guys are doing there is an exercise and a model in sustainability on a larger scale. So um, it's a grand, grand, you know, exercise and experiment and good for you for doing it. And it will be successful. I mean, clearly, um, I think I wanted to add, I wanted to speak a little bit to your website, which is kind of an odd thing to do, right? And we, we never do that, but I have to say your website is one of the best information delivery systems that I've seen ever, and I speak with some degree of authority, that you cover a lot of territory, it's digestible, it's it's easy to navigate, and you have the information there that anybody can ex access, and it is very transparent. I mean, the budgets, the, all the accounting, everything is there, and it speaks highly of you. And I'm, I'm wondering, how are you guys able to pull off such a good model with that? Because you would not... Uh, you use the digital tools very well is where I'm going with that. And I well, find it interesting that you're able to, to mix those two, um, you know, two parts of the toolkit. So I was wondering who does that, how they do it, you know, just briefly. Um, are you writing all that yourself? <laughs> I mean, it's it's pretty in-depth and pretty detailed. Well, yeah, um, it kind of evolved. So, you know, when we I was taught how to write HTML by a 10 year old uh, in uh, what, 1996 or 97. And I've kind of, uh, he taught me, it took him about 10, 15 minutes to teach me web design. And so after that, I just kind of started flying. And of course, in 96, 97, there was not as much happening, of course, on the web. So I've slightly evolved with, with that myself. Now, some people think it should have more uh, you know, tables and all these things like that. But I actually found, because I also travel a lot and I go to Africa and stuff, that to make it as simple as possible and is really uh, advantageous because a lot of people have dial-up and have like a really difficult time accessing stuff. So just to make it clear and easy and simple so that you can find everything, uh, I felt was really important. And uh, for instance, I uh, this is something that people often think is weird. I, you know, I just recently uh, wrote another book called Hungry for Peace, and the whole 184-page um, book is up online as a PDF that you could actually just download. It's really nice if you happen to purchase it uh, through us. Uh, um, you know, th that's really great. But the thing is that if you in, are in Africa and you want to do food up bombs, we want you to be able to have the same amount of access to all this information as you would have if you had the resources to have us mail you a copy. So, uh, to, and, and the reality is we probably sell more copies uh, just because it is for free online and people get sick of reading it, but they can uh, also share it to everybody within their group and you go, oh, look at uh, page you know, 62 about uh, whatever this idea is. And it goes hand in hand with the whole DIY aspect of Food Not Bombs that has always existed. Um, is that you, you know, we have a seven steps of starting a Funa Bombs, which was originally written in uh, uh, 1988, but has been updated as uh, Facebook came about and Skype came about and all these things have started happening. And, um, you know, so we try to keep up with, with that, but also to make it so that people can do it with as little money as possible. And one of the aspects of, uh, I just had a call today about the, this person from Miami thought, 
food about why we're vegan and stuff and he had some idea about fish were great and we're like well look at if you don't have any money then you can't be refrigerating buying refrigerators and all this stuff and so to guarantee that all the food is safe besides being you know all the other uh, ethical reasons and uh practical reasons of having food be uh, vegan and vegetarian yet uh, you don't need to buy all that equipment if you're going to uh, be making vegan meals and then you're not going to make somebody sick you know right. and that's why we're you know, sharing these meals for all these years we've never made anybody ill so that just uh, uh, makes a ton of sense so uh, anyway yeah I've written uh, um, you know most of those pages or had other you know and uh, we have like a, a proofreaders and stuff that's passed by people or people will send in stuff from other groups and then we'll post it up there and uh, we have like a new campaign section which i try to update like all the time one of the biggest jobs that we do is to update the uh, contact list mm -hmm. and uh we do some work trying to find the you know it's uh, there's 600 uh, chapters listed oh there's 600 chapters listed on uh on, on the website and uh, but we know that for instance there's like 17 or 18 Russian ones but they tell us that there's 60 groups there but they never really get us all the 60 contacts and you know I know there's 20 groups in Finland but I only have something like three or four listed up there I don't even know half the groups in, in uh, places like uh, the Philippines and uh, Indonesia and stuff like that but you know we do you know there's approximately um, one Food Not Bombs chapter listed for everyone that's not listed is the best we can tell. Right. It's um, really an admirable, I, I love the accessibility of it and the availability of information to everybody at all levels. Um, you know, and I think in our arena, um, you, you know, using all the digital tools and all that, we sometimes forget that there's a distinct digital divide. And I love the fact that you create an environment where somebody in Africa has accessibility to information that somebody in Manhattan does. That that speaks really well and is reflective of the organization. Um, let's talk a little bit about the unspoken politics and power dynamics of food. It For something so simple and basic, it seems like such a volatile issue. So, where can you speak to that a little bit? Does that question even make sense to you? I mean, in all my research, I was, you know, I was struck by how much controversy revolves around food. Well, you know, right now it's been becoming more and more controversial because. Um, you know, one of the things that's happened is, particularly in 2008, when the housing uh, uh, when housing collapsed, um, a lot of people started investing in food, and so food prices went up. And at the same time, uh, control of food got more and more severe with Monsanto uh, owning like huge percentage of all of the uh, nine leading grains. Um, like owning the seeds and and actually trying to keep people from grow, you know, saving seeds and and so all those things um, kind of control the food is like an important aspect of social control by uh, by corporate and government leaders and uh, you can also see like for instance with Katrina, Red Cross actually had an agreement with FEMA that they would not bring food to uh, New Orleans because they were trying to use food as uh, the lack of food actually as a a lure to get everybody out of the area and um the uh and there's uh, politics around that there's some suggestion uh that i came across which i have in my book on how the uh you know certain politicians thought that they could then gentrify new orleans and make more money and 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 that but then the other thing is that uh you know even on the local level but as a national policies there's things like weed and seed and so on uh that are Funded by our tax dollars, in the Justice Department, where they actually use kitchens and so on, and food banks as a form of social control, threatening to shut food banks or soup kitchens down if people don't behave, um, things like that. So, for instance, if there's a shooting in a community at, where an unarmed person is killed by the police, then a lot of times they'll be like, oh, don't be uh, protesting that because then we're going to lose uh, access to our food. And they will pit poor people against one another to uh, to save 
things like uh, food banks so that, uh, um, you know, when actually everybody should just have food, you know, it's like food, food's a right, not a privilege. So, um, you know, you could also see that in, in you know, the, like the farm subsidy issue. Billions of dollars going to fund uh, corn syrup and, and genetically modified foods, foods that are uh, where, with patents, that where you have to buy the seeds and the activator genes, uh, food which we're seeing now is failing in a major way because of the droughts and uh, that they're not working, the pesticide aspects of them are not really working. They were, the whole idea of GMOs is just so that these companies, and primarily Montana, can own the food, and therefore we have to come back to them every season to get the seeds, and that they own also a matrix of, of cooperations, and, and so, you know they work in conjunction with banks, with people buying the food. It's a whole system of corporate domination and corporate control, and uh, and it, that is probably at, at no time in Food Not Bombs 32 history has this issue been of, of more concern, because we can see, um, you know, we've been working against it for the whole 32 years, but, you know, with the drought this year, I mean, we're having like severe droughts even here uh, in uh, New Mexico. We're going to see food prices doubling, possibly. That's what the UN says. That's what economists are saying. And we can see the last time food prices uh, jumped really high, you had uh, like a produce vendor burn himself to death, uh, Mohammed, in uh, Tunisia. And that sparked a huge rebellion throughout the you know, first Tunisia, then in Egypt, and then and still to this day, there's uprisings in, in Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, Kuwait, all out of like this uh, fact that... Uh, um, the price of food was taking up such a huge percentage of people's uh, daily income. So, you know, the, the uh, it, it's a very super volatile issue because one thing people need is water. They need oxygen. They need food. You know, they need a place to be. And, they, and, and that's even uh, not saying anything about health care and, and having dinner and so on. And the fact that the, that the governments and the corporations are systematically and spending billions of dollars to figure out how to maintain control of these uh, items and to force us to, to go to them just to, to eat and, uh, and to, that they dictate the prices and stuff. It's really outrageous. And so, uh, you know, there's the, almost everything is starting to become linked uh, to food. And we saw that originally even uh, back when we started in 1988, I mean 1980, but uh, it's growing more so every day. It's just really incredible. Yeah, I actually am involved with a couple of local food justice, you know, actions in, in our area. And, you know, that was uh, something I came to just recently in the past couple of years. And now my experience with them has been that, I find it incredible that food and hunger are used as leverage against people because it's almost yeah. like there's always a condition, right? I mean, this is what you run into is, okay, we're going to do this soup kitchen, but here's the conditions, and as long as people meet the conditions, then they're welcome to eat, which is, you know, just – it's just wrong, you know. <laughs> you shouldn't you shouldn't use that as leverage against people. Um, That's exactly right. Yeah, it's really frightening. Well, I hope people can get involved with us. Um, you know, uh, pretty soon. Uh, I'm going to go. I'm having an electrical problem on my end. I'm smelling some weirdness. Um, so I might want to uh, sign off pretty soon. Um, but I definitely want to encourage people to come to foodnotbombs.net and get involved in what we're doing. And, uh, and again, we certainly appreciate any financial support. Uh, you could see, as you pointed out, that the financial issue is really clear. And, uh, and we're not spending money on salaries and on stuff like that. It's really bare bones. But for the little money that we have, we get a ton out of it. So right. it's like pretty amazing. Well, if if you're about or on the verge of equipment problems because of overheating or anything, I want to give you the opportunity to uh, speak out on anything else you might want to, and then uh, we can we can wrap it up if you would like to. Yeah, I should. I probably should. I it does smell like an electrical fire here. 
somewhere, but I don't know what that's about. Um, so anyway, yeah, what, the main thing is that for people to get involved in Food Not Bombs, the whole thing about Food Not Bombs is our volunteers. It's like if you want to start a chapter, you can go to foodnotbombs.net to uh, start a chapter. You can, donate. you can see also on foodnotbombs.net, it says donate today on, on there. That's There's PayPal, there's sending checks. That's super, super uh, helpful right now. Sometimes we go for months and months, we're totally oblivious to needing funding. And then sometimes like now, we're like, oh my God, we really need some funding. So that, that would be super helpful. And if you can uh, forward that website onto all your Facebooks and stuff, there's also a free school website. There's Food Not Bombs uh, Facebooks and stuff like that. All that you can find through foodnotbombs.net. And then uh, also, um, you know, we're about to go out on a tour uh, right after the World Gathering. We'll go out to on the uh, Food Not Bombs, uh, uh, the Elect End Hunger and Poverty Tour where um, I speak about the history of Food Not Bombs and, and the philosophy and, uh, and what basically Food Not Bombs is currently doing now, and, uh, and, and then how you can get involved and how you can support it. And usually a local chapter might participate, and so it's a way of getting more people to volunteer with the local chapter, doing all the different projects like Food Not Lawns, like uh, really really free markets and so on and um, and also that you can get the book online too hungry for peace and it's all just right there on the website foodnotbombs.net and we have a toll-free number the hunger hotline at 1-800-884-1136 and you can go to any pay phone anywhere and just dial us up and uh and if i'm not in the middle of something i'll be able to talk to you so and sometimes the pat phone passes around from person to person so it just depends on the situation but um you know a lot of the time it's me picking up the phone yeah. so excellent, uh, excellent. and then and try to, and if you want to uh, apply for uh, we haven't set up an application system yet or figured out exactly how to do this but you know in may next year for sure they are going to be trying to organize a whole system of different classes workshops and, and uh, permaculture and so on here uh, on the land in uh, Taos, new mexico okay excellent and thank you Thank you for all of that, and um, I want to make sure everybody does understand and encourage you guys a lot to check out the Food Not Bombs Net website. You'll be really impressed. Um, some of your Ta Taos community members are watching tonight, and they wanted me to give a shout out and let you know that they're watching, and thank you for, for your support. And um, also, the um, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up so Keith can unplug and cool down here. We don't want any equipment meltdown. So um, the chat streams and all the viewers are very grateful for you taking the time with us. I really appreciate it. It was extremely interesting and informative. Um, I'd like to talk to you about coming on again maybe after, you know, the – after the conventions and after your events, and maybe we could talk to you while you're on the road for the Elect to End Poverty and Hunger Tour. Um, that would be fun. But also, I know you're involved in consensus decision-making education and things like that. So that's a whole other show, and we might want to explore that with you. And on a final note, um, I want to encourage you to check your – email because I'm going to send you some contacts here in our mountain areas that you may already know but that I think you would be interested in in knowing about so we're going to say thank you very much and we wish you well and thank you for the work you're doing the free school project is near and dear to my heart um, I appreciate it and wish you all the luck in the world and I'm passing on that same thanks and commentary from our viewers so I hope you have a good evening. Thank you so much for being here. Great. Thanks so much for having me. That was really fun. <laughs> Take care, you guys. I look forward to hearing from everybody. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>